Why do I not like the keto diet? Hey guys, welcome back. Dr. Ryan Lowry here. And today we're gonna be talking about a brand new video from my friend Jillian Michaels um, that a lot of people were tagging me in, a lot of people were sending it to me. And listen, I wanna use this as an opportunity to teach and I wanna foster conversation because I think Jillian has the ability to affect millions of people's lives. Uh, and I do think that the work that she's done in the past She's, she's helped a lot of people. Um, I don't necessarily agree with a lot of the tactics and strategies that are utilized on the show. Um, and I certainly don't agree with a lot of her opinions in terms of what she thinks about a ketogenic diet, but she just recently came out and tried to break down because I think she's been getting a lot of backlash about ketosis, ketogenic diet and why she hates it. And so let's, let's play the video real quick. Why do I not like the keto diet? I have gotten that question a heck of a lot over the past couple of years. Um, so first thing, let me clarify that this isn't a like or dislike thing. Like it's not a take from me what I do. It's not an opinion. I educate myself about things involving fitness and nutrition because it's my passion, it's my job, it's what I do, right? And I am educated by some of the best professionals in the world. When I write a book, it's not by myself in a vacuum. Right. If you guys have ever read any of my books, it's with one of the top corresponding appropriate medical professionals in space. So if it's a book on metabolism, I'm working with one of the top board certified endocrinologists. If it's a book on anti-aging or how to slow the aging process and inhibit disease, I'm working with some of the top biochemists, registered dietitians, endocrinologists, physiatrists, and I will look at different studies and ask different questions and have this information interpreted by professionals who can explain it to me in layman's terms. And then I form a conclusion, right? So when I tell you, yeah, keto, no bueno, it's not, it's not like a person I met on the street and I didn't like. What can it do, right? It can, it can help you lose weight, it can. And it can have a very positive impact on insulin related diseases and health conditions like type two diabetes, for example, right? Or PCOS. And you'll hear sometimes I lost 20 pounds. I'm no longer on my type two diabetes medication. And that is likely true. Now that's wonderful news, right? And people are like, oh, this is fantastic. And I don't have to, I can eat whatever I want and do this. No, not really. All right. But, but first of all, all those benefits, I can give you. I can help you reverse insulin insulin related health conditions. I can help you lose weight. I don't even have to help you. I can tell you what to do, right? Eat less, use common sense with your food choices, move your body more often. What's one of the most effective, if not the most effective way to resensitize your body to insulin? Fitness. Now then, what are the negative side effects of keto? So I mean, you're looking at a diet that's very high in animal protein, very high in saturated fat. Arguably, the, um, the typical individual engages in, in keto and you know they're posting bacon emojis on my comment section. So, you know, this is an individual's eating, as I said, a lot of animal protein of no particular quality and, uh, you know, a lot of fat. If you did keto perfectly, right? Because I mean, look, that's a diet that's gonna be low in fiber and high in meat that's filled with preservatives and hormones and antibiotics. But let's say you did keto perfectly. And what I mean by that is you did all hormone-free, wild-caught, cage-free, antibiotic-free, grass-fed, grass-finished beef, wild-caught salmon, free range organic chicken. I mean, all the fats were predominantly polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, which is virtually impossible when you're eating a ton of animal protein. But, but let's say you, know, you, you, you did predominantly plant-based keto and less meat and just the meat was that crazy high quality. You're still ingesting a diet that's very high in animal protein and saturated fat. We know 
that diets high in animal protein and saturated fat have a host of negative side effects. So you can see she talks about like, oh, it's not a like or dislike thing. Um, you know, even though she's very been very outspoken about how she doesn't like a ketogenic diet and then she kind of gives reasons and at the end she says again, like, I don't like a ketogenic diet, which is fine. Um, but she does bring up some points in which she might say a ketogenic diet could be beneficial, right? Which is a huge win. And here's the point is I do not think a ketogenic diet is a be all end all for anything and everything. I think it is a lifestyle that many people would benefit from depending upon what their overall goal is. And I want to break down some of her points to use this as an, as an educational session, as, an, as a learning example of people who have influence and power just need to be careful about what they say, how they say it, and how they deliver the message, especially when it lacks scientific credibility, right? So I'll start with that. One of the things that Jillian says in the beginning, because she's obviously talking about her, her book, I don't know if it's recent or not recent, she goes, and I'm going to quote her, she said, it's not an opinion, I educate myself. I'm educated by some of the best professionals in the world. When I say keto is no bueno, it's not like I, I, it's not like a person that I met on the street that I didn't like. Basically, she's referencing the fact that a lot of these professionals that she, I guess, speaks with or talks to or co-authors books with do not like a ketogenic diet, and she takes their opinion or, or whatever they're, they're trying to provide as evidence uh, and utilize that to go, this is why I don't think a ketogenic diet is going to be beneficial. First off, uh, I, I appreciate the fact that she admits she's, she's uh, not the professional or scientist when it comes to this matter. Uh, I respect that. Two, I'd encourage her to pick new people, right? Like I don't surround myself with only people who support a ketogenic diet. I don't surround myself with only people who eat meat, which we'll, we'll get into because uh, she doesn't seem to like uh, high amounts of animal meat, which I know a lot of my colleagues and friends would argue against. I also have a lot of good friends and colleagues who teach me a lot about vegan and vegetarianism and then a lot of people who are carnivore. Like I think having different perspectives helps people come to a better conclusion. Like I, I do think carnivore can be applicable and be a very great tool. If someone chooses vegan, uh, why they choose it I think is important, but they need to understand things to supplement or implement into their diet. But I'm not on either side of the fence in that regard, but I understand both viewpoints and the scientific rationale. I challenge her to do the same thing here. Uh, I really, really would. So I'm about to talk a little bit about some science to kind of talk about some of the points that she brought up. First and foremost, uh, again, huge kudos to her for admitting, she says keto can help you lose weight and can have benefits for insulin related diseases like type two diabetes and PCOS. I 100% agree with her. The data is overwhelming in that regard. Uh, there's a lot more that there's data to support as well. Uh, but she, she is spot on with that. It can actually help you lose fat. I don't like to use the word weight. Can help you lose fat, uh, maintain or gain uh, muscle mass if done with resistance training, and then of course have effects on type 2 diabetes. My friends over at Verta Health are doing some great work there and PCOS, which is uh, common in, in women as well. The other thing she mentions that I 100% agree with is fitness is the greatest way to sensitize yourself to insulin, right? If you want to improve insulin sensitivity, you can certainly do it through diet. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But exercise, ideally a combination of like high intensity interval training and resistance exercise is the best way to do it, right? The more muscle you have, the more insulin sensitive you are likely going to be, right? So uh, again, don't discount the importance of fitness or exercise. The challenge is, especially during these times, like a lot of people aren't working out, let alone resistance training. Like if they are working out, they might be going and, and have it going for a walk every day or going for a run, maybe doing a Peloton at home, which all that's good. Any form of exercise or movement's good. But resistance training with that, uh, with some high intensity interval training and some cardio would be ideal or beneficial. Now here's where we start to get into some things that we don't necessarily agree upon. And uh, again, we can agree to disagree, but let's let the science do the talking. Well, all those benefits I can give you. I can help you reverse insulin, insulin related health conditions. I can help you lose weight. I don't even have to help you. I can tell you what to do, right? Eat less, use common sense with your food choices, move your body more often. You guys know how I feel about this, right? Uh, I think on paper, the premise stands, right? Of course, 
if we're eating less and we're eating more whole foods, less processed foods, and we're moving our body more, can we get that? Sure, but guess what? That's been the recommendation since the 1970s and has it had an effect? Yeah, it's had an effect in a worse way. We've gotten fatter, our obesity rate's climbing, our type two diabetes is climbing, Alzheimer's rates, which could be theoretically looked at as a metabolic disease, cancer rates, uh, which some would argue are a metabolic disease. All of these things are continuing to climb and yet the recommendation has always been eat less, move more. Is that working? I would say no, uh, I would say no. And so we need to be better at just making general recommendations of eat less, move more. The second thing I wanna say is that this, this logic, the same eat less, move more, could apply to people who are depressed and have severe anxiety, right? Think about our military, think about uh, uh, people who are children or adults that suffer with suicidal thoughts or depression, right? A lot of times you can take that same rationale, that same logic and go, hey, it's just about be, be sad less and be happy more, right? Of course, on paper that's like, yeah, would that help them? Yeah, but that's not, how, that's not reality. That's not how it pans out in the real world. Just like when you tell someone who's struggling with uh, being metabolically overweight um, or having obesity and all these metabolic complications, oh, just put the fork down, eat less, move more. You can't tell someone with severe depression, hey, just be happy, it's not gonna work. There's something deeper going on. And so we need to look at the mental, the physical, the emotional health as well, versus just making these blanket recommendations. So that's something that irks me a lot uh, and something that is often a recommendation, but it misses the mark, it misses the mark. So again, she says you can eat less, move more, and get all the same benefits of keto. And she was referring to like the benefits with like insulin sensitivity and weight loss without the negative side effects. So. Before we jump into the negative side effects that she claims, uh, let's jump into, can you get the same benefits um, with being keto or not keto? Like she's saying there's nothing advantageous or more metabolic advantage with keto. Um, first and foremost, I do think you could in some cases, right? And in some cases for people who are really dialed in, who are tracking, who are metabolically healthy, do not have severe insulin resistance, of course. There's many, many ways. Again, keto is not the only way. But I wanna look at this study. Um, here's an interesting study just to look at. Is This was done by Webb in 1983, and it was overfeeding, an overfeeding study in lean uh, and overweight men and women. And they basically had these people overeat uh, for 30 days. And guess what? That's a lot of people right now. A lot of people right now are overeating, right? We're not eating less right now. We're stuck, stuck at home, quarantined. People are eating a lot more. And they had both of these groups overeat by a thousand calories per day. One group ate 60% of their diet as carbohydrates. The other group ate a higher fat, higher protein, right? They both overate by a thousand calories per day. So if we're just talking that it's calories in, calories out, eat less, move more, kind of same premise, right? Theoretically, they both should have gained the same amount of weight, right? They both overate by the same amount of calories. Well, guess what? People who ate over eight by 60, per, that were eating 60% of their calories from carbohydrates gained 2.7 kilograms, whereas the group that was having a higher fat, higher protein only gained 1.7 kilograms. So a kilogram less over 30 days. Um, shows you that it's not as simple as just this eat less, move more, especially even when calories are equated. Let's look at another one, right? Uh, this study is by Shai, weight loss with a low carbohydrate versus a Mediterranean versus a low fat diet. Two years, right? A lot of subjects, two years. The mean weight loss uh, was 2.9 kilograms for the low fat group, 4.4 kilograms for the Mediterranean group, 4.7 kilograms for the low carbohydrate group, and the low carbohydrate group saw better uh, decreases or greater decreases in lipid profiles, which I know is a big concern for a lot of people. Uh, is like, oh, what about my cholesterol? The low carbohydrate group saw the greatest benefit in that regard, and guess what? Calories were also uh, equivocal in this. No significant differences over this two-year trial. So again, studies after studies showing like there might be some metabolic advantage. Now. Uh, one of the things that I want to look at as well is what about 
uh, adherence, right? That's a big thing about adherence. Um, but before we jump into that, let's jump into the last one with Samaha, a low carbohydrate as compared to a low fat diet. Again, 79 subjects, six month study, uh, the low carbohydrate group lost more weight than those on the low fat diet. Again, uh, we can we can pull studies like this over and over again. They lost 5.8 kilograms versus 1.9 kilograms. So this is this seems to be like a, re a reoccurring theme. And the most important thing is, what about adherence? The best diet you can do is the one that you can adhere to the longest. And a lot of times people think, oh, keto or low carb is super restrictive. There's no way I could adhere to that, right? Well, in this study, if you look at it, the people who dropped out by months three was 44% in the low fat group and 27% in the low carbohydrate group. So more people dropped out in the low fat condition than dropped out in the low carbohydrate condition, right? Who would have guessed that, right? So that's important to understand is that no matter what you're doing, adherence is going to be the most important thing. And is dieting in any regard going to be easy? No, uh, if you're dedicated to it and you're putting in the work, but it has to be something that you can make a lifestyle. And based on some of these studies, it seems to be that people tend to adhere more to a low carbohydrate approach than even just comparatively to a low fat approach. So that's one point. The second point I wanna make is on satiety, right? So let's talk about satiety or fullness, right? Uh, one of the benefits of ketosis or eating a ketogenic way is people tend to eat less naturally, right? They don't tend to eat as many calories even when fed ad libitum, meaning you could eat as much as you want. Ketosis tends to decrease or have effects on things like ghrelin and leptin in a sense that it helps you, helps you eat less. And tr like we said before, we're facing a problem where people are, tend to be overeating. So here's a study uh, by John Stone, 2008, and they compared hunger, appetite, and weight loss to a high protein, uh, low carbohydrate versus a high protein, medium carbohydrate in obese men. And again, they were they let them eat ad libitum, meaning as much as you want. Uh, and what they found was that ad libitum intake was lower when they had a lower amount of carbohydrates, even though both groups were high protein. The low carbohydrate group had a lower calorie intake than the moderate carbohydrate intake, and that resulted in uh, greater fat loss uh, and, again, lower hunger despite the fact that there was uh, the same amount of protein. So again, over and over again, I can, I can point to these studies and I would love to sit down with Jillian and talk about this because I think it's important to understand the other end of the spectrum. There is a host of studies that have equated for protein, right? A lot of early on people who would say, oh, it's just the fact that keto is higher in protein. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but the reality is there's plenty of studies that show even when protein is matched. I've talked about this in a completely separate video. Even when protein is matched, there seems to be a, a metabolic advantage to a ketogenic diet. Now, how that carries out over six months, a year, two years, up, no one knows. Um, but in these studies, despite the fact that they're eating the same amount of protein and roughly the same amount of calories, and again, there's limitations to research with tracking, how accurate is it, but no differences in calories, no differences in protein, greater results. And so, again, I won't go through all these, but uh, we, can, we can discuss them later. So the next point she brings up is uh, about eating a lot of animal protein. And I agree that, listen, if possible, you wanna have grass-fed, grass-finished. You wanna have organic. Um, like, you wanna, you wanna do things the right way. But listen, uh, not everyone can afford that. Even if you're not on a ketogenic diet, I highly recommend animal-based foods unless you're doing vegan for uh, some uh, religious reasons, the humane aspect. You can check out my video on the Game Changers to see why I don't think that's necessarily true, what, that what a lot of people say they're doing it for humane reasons, but uh, story for a different uh, day. But she said, diets that are very high in animal protein and saturated fat, relating that to a ketogenic diet, she says, we know they have negative effects. Look, I wrote it in my book and she shows her book. I, I personally haven't read her book. Um, maybe there's some, there's some data in there, but like what I've seen so far, there's zero data that indicates that foods solely high in protein and saturated fats have a negative effect. Qualitative data, sure. Uh, and what that what that means is like I can take quali 
qualitative data, send out a survey to a bunch of people and go, do you tend to eat foods that are high in animal protein, and high in saturated fat, and then also ask them like, hey, do you have diabetes? What's your cholesterol levels? And sure, qualitative data would come back and would likely point to the fact that, oh, these people who tend to eat foods that are higher in animal protein and higher in saturated fat tend to also have a lot of these complications. Well, guess what? You know what food is high in animal protein and high in sa and saturated fat? A Big Mac. Uh, a lot of unhealthy bowls and, and things from Panera or all these dishes from fried foods and things like that. Those are high in animal protein. They're also high in saturated fat. Does that mean that it's the, the animal protein saturated fat that's causing the issue? No, in fact, there are studies showing that fat is inert without the presence of carbohydrates. Um, so again, you have to understand these things in context. I would love to know, and I'm sure my friends, Sean Baker and Paul Saladino would love to have a conversation with her about this. Not that I'm arguing like, oh, everyone should be eating a high, high, high amount of animal meat all the time. That's not what I'm arguing. Um, I do think animal meat's a superior source of protein to plant-based meats, 1000%. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But if you have more interest in that and understanding about diet high in animal or, or saturated fat, go check out The Carnivore Code by Paul Saldino and The Carnivore Diet um, by Sean Baker. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't follow a carnivore approach. I think it's a tool, but they have some good resources and references discussing why I think a lot of that's overinflated. Couple other things that I wanna address from her. One, and she said that- The bottom line is that diets high in fat and high in animal, and animal protein accelerate the shortening of your telomeres, can cause um, a host of things to go wrong with your DNA and your epigenome. It can throw off your microbiome, and your microbiome is related to everything from your immunity to your longevity to your gut health. And in fact, it's not even a can, it does. I'm gonna just list these studies that show that would be counter to that. There are several studies. In fact, we've done, a re we've done a study with our good friends at Auburn University, Dr. Mike Roberts, showing that a ketogenic diet in animals extends lifespan and longevity. There's been plenty of studies looking at a ketogenic diet can increase longevity. Um, ketogenic diet reduces midlife mortality and improves memory in aging mice. Ketogenic diet attenuates aging associated myocardial remodeling and dysfunction in mice. That's a brand new study that was just published this year about how a ketogenic diet may actually have beneficial effects on the heart despite all of the animal and saturated fat, right? So again, we need to look at the entire picture and give context. And then one of the last things I want to talk about is guess what stunts our stem cells dead in their tracks? High saturated fat diets. Yes, if it's just a diet high in saturated fat. Again, eating Big Macs, Big Macs and large fry is a diet that's high in saturated fat. Being in a state of ketosis is radically different. It's very, very different metabolic state. When you have the typical American diet, which is high in carbohydrates, high in saturated fat, of course. Of course, so one could argue that you're, it's maybe not even the saturated fat by itself, it's the combination of the two, which is what I believe as well, is there's data showing the combination of high amounts of fat and high amounts of carbohydrates leads to a metabolic disaster. Of course, you might as well walk into McDonald's right now and that's what most people tend to eat every single day. That is where that data is coming from, that diets high in saturated fat blunt our body stem cells. There's new studies showing that B ketones being in ketosis actually protects stem cells. So again, ketosis is a radically different metabolic state than just making this assumption that, oh, all diets high in saturated fat. No, 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 no. It's diets that are high in saturated fat, probably highly processed saturated fats and high in carbohydrates like your typical American diet. You cannot take that research and translate it over to a well-formulated ketogenic diet. It does not apply. It does not apply. And then the last thing I wanna say is this, and this is just as a friend and colleague and talking to her, and trust me, I know it's, it's easy to make claims and, and just make some bold things. She said, So when you start to cut out superfoods like pomegranates, kiwi, purple potatoes, I mean, if you looked at the research behind what these foods can do for your overall health in fighting things like cancer, 
right? Um, I would caution you to be very, very, very cautious about that statement. Um, one, there's no data in humans showing that that's the case. All of it's in, in animal models, and it's not the fact that someone's eating a purple potato and it's killing their colon cancer. It's the anthocyanins inside of a purple potato, which are high in antioxidants, that could have an effect on colon cancer. Going around and telling people that, oh, because a ketogenic diet doesn't allow you to have purple potatoes or kiwi, like it's negative because it's, have, it's, it's cutting out all these foods that could potentially have all these amazing benefits for cancer. That's a dangerous road to go down because I can show you an entire chapter in our book that we wrote going all over why I think a ketogenic diet could be beneficial in conjunction with the standard of care in regards to cancer. I think the data for that's overwhelming, depending upon which cancer it is and depending upon how, uh, if it's metastasized, how far along is it. But my good friend Thomas Seafried has an entire book talking about cancer as a metabolic disease and how do we address that from a nutritional standpoint, right? In that book, he also talks about something that I would caution you to be very, very, very uh, curious on is tumor size is directly proportional to the amount of glucose in the blood. So sure, maybe there's some anthocyanins inside of a purple potato that have some antioxidants that you're getting, but guess what you're also providing? A ton of carbohydrates, a ton of glucose. And guess what cancer cells thrive off of? Sugar and glucose, baby. That's exactly what they thrive off of. So like, it's, it's not a perfect like, oh, just eat purple potatoes. Like, get very, very weary when people make these bold, bold, bold assumptions without knowing the entire picture. It's not, there's a lot of great researchers who are leading the field in that way. And we need to be careful about making unsubstantiated bold claims. And we need to understand that entire picture. I could literally sit here and do an entire presentation on the, on cancer, but um, there's a lot of my colleagues, Dr. Angela Poff, uh, Dr. Adrian Sheck, Dr. Thomas Seafried, um, all of them are doing incredible work actively looking at everything from glioblastomas to prostate cancer, whatever it is, utilizing a key drink diet with and without standard of care. Um, so check out some of their work. Now, I wanna wrap this up because I don't wanna make this a long, th a long video, but uh, the reality is this. A lot of what she points out is unsubstantiated and it's one-sided. I'm not saying that my side's right, her side's wrong. I think there needs to be a fostered discussion. I think the scientific evidence tends to point to the fact that the benefits of a well-formulated ketogenic diet far outweigh any of the negatives and none of the negatives that she presented were more substantial or scientifically valid uh, when in context of a ketogenic diet. Sure, diet high in saturated fat and highly processed carbohydrates, I think we could all agree is not ideal for anyone. But we can't take that research and translate it over and go, oh, well, a ketogenic diet is not beneficial because of these same reasons. So, Jillian, I know you don't like, even though you said in the beginning, I know you don't like a ketogenic diet. I challenge you to open up your perspective, bring in some new experts uh, and some people that you deem as highly qualified scientists, people who have published and all these things, and maybe gain a little bit more understanding of the physiology of how ketosis works and some of the latest research that's been going on. And again, it's not something that needs to be for every single person, but I promise you, uh, there's a lot more than just PCOS, type two diabetes and weight loss that a ketogenic diet has a ton of potential for. And the negative side effects I think you'll start to see aren't dictated by the ketogenic diet, but rather a diet high in saturated fat and highly processed carbohydrates. So. Guys, I appreciate you guys taking the time uh, watching this video. Let me know what your thoughts down in the comments, some other things that you want me to address. I'm here to help educate and provide resources for you guys. So as always, love you guys, and I'll talk to you soon.